I never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. But look to it. Let my officers of such a nature make it extend upon his house and lands. Do this expediently and turn him going. <laughs> Survey with a chaste eye from hell's fair above, thy huntress's name that my full life doth sway. O oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts all character. That every eye in which this forest looks will see thy virtues painted everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, the unexpressive she. How like you the shem of what? Last the touchstone? Truly, Shepherd, in respect of a in respect of itself, it is a good life. But in respect of that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. In respect that it is solitary, I like it very well. But in respect that it is private, it is a very vile life. In respect that it is in the fields, it pleaseth me very well. But in respect that it is not in court, it is tedious. As it is a spare life, it fits my humor well. But as there is no plenty in it, it goes much against my stomach. Hast any philosophy in thee, Shepherd? No more than that I know that the more one sickens, the worse that easy is. And that he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. <clears throat> that the property of rain is to wet and fire to burn. A good pasture makes fat sheep. <clears throat> and that a great cause of the night is lack of sun. And that he that hath learned no wit by nature nor by art may complain of good breeding, or is of a very dull kindred. Such a one is a natural philosopher, was ever in court shepherd? No, truly. Then thou art damned. Nay, I hope. Truly, thou art damned like an ill-roasted egg all on one side. For not being at court your reason? Well, if thou never was at court, thou never sawst good manners. If thou never sawst good manners, then thy manners are wicked, and wickedness sin. And wickedness is sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a parlous state, Shepherd. Not only touchstone, those that are those that are those that are common manners in the court are as ridiculous in the country as those in the country are most remarkable at court. You told me that you salute not, but kiss hands. That courtesy would be very uncleanly if shepherd if courtiers were shepherds. Instance, briefly, come, instance. Well, we're still handling our ewes and their fells, as you know, are greasy. Why do not your courtier's hands sweat? And is the sweat of a man not as wholesome as the grease of a mutton? Shallow instance. A, a sounder instance, I say, come. Besides, our hands are hard. Your lips will feel them sooner. Shallow again, a more sounder instance, come. Our hands are hard over the surgery of our lambs. Would you have us kiss? Tar? Most. The, the courtier's hands are perfumed with si civet. Most shallow man, thy words meet in, a, in respect of a good piece of flesh. Learn from the wise and perpet. Civet is of a baser birth than tar, the very uncleanly flux of a cat. Mend thy instance, shepherd. You have two courtly away from me. I'll rest. <coughs> Will thou rest again? <coughs> God help thee. God fix thee. God make an incision in thee. Thou art raw. Sir, I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat, get that I wear. Own no man hate, and be no man's ha happiness. Glad with my content, content with my harm, 
And my greatest pride is to see my lambs suck and my ewes graze. That is another sip of sin in you, to bring the ewes and the rams together and to, to offer to get your copulation of cattle, to be bought by a bellwether and to betray a sea lamb of a twelve month unto an old padded cuckoldy ram. If you thou wilt not be damned for this, then the devil himself would not have any shepherds. I cannot see how thou should escape. Here comes young Master Ganymede, my new mistress's brother. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her worth being mounted on the wind, through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are all but black to Ro Rosaline. Let no fair be kept in mind but the fair of Rosaline. I'll take that. I'll lie you so eight years together, sleeping hours and suppers and breakfast accepted. Ow. Oh, fool. That is the right butter, by woman's rank to market. For a taste, if a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosaline. If the cat will after cart, so to cat will Rosaline. Winter garments but must be lined, so must slender Rosaline. They that reap must sheaf and bind, so is not as Rosaline. He that wait must wait. Such a nut is Rosaline. He that sweetest rose will find, must find, love, must find love's prick in Rosaline. This is a very false gallop of verses. Why do you infect yourself with them? Peace, fool. I found them on a tree. Well, truly, the tree yields bad fruit. I'll graft it with you, and then I shall graft it with the meddler. Then it will be the earliest fruit in the country, for you'll be rotten ere you be half ripe, and that's the true virtue of the meddler. Whether wisely or not, let the forest judge. Peace. Here comes my sister reading. Stand aside. Why should this a desert be, for it isn't peopled? No. Tongues will hang on every tree, that civil saying show. Somehow the brief, the life of man, runs his erring pilgrimage, that the stretching of a span buckles in his sum of age. Oh, sum, sum of age. Some of violated vows twits the souls of friend and friend, but upon the fairest boughs, or at every sentence end, will I, <sighs> Rosalinda write, Teaching all that read to know the quintessence of every sprite. Heaven would in little show, therefore heaven nature charge that one body shall be filled with all graces wide and large. Nature's presently distilled, Helen's cheek, but not her heart. Cleopatra's majesty, Atlanta's better part. Sad Lucretia's modesty, thus rosin of many parts by heavenly signet, was devised of many faces eyes and hearts to have the touches dearest prize heaven would that she these gifts should have an eye to live and die her slab slave oh most gentle jupiter what tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners with all and never cried have patience good people how now back friends shepherd go off a little go with him sirrah Come, Shepherd, let us make an honorable retreat, not with bag and baggage, but with scrimp and scrimpage. Didst thou hear these verses? Oh, yes, I heard them all, and more of them too, for some of them had in them more feet than the verses could bear. That's no matter, the feet might bear the verses. Aye, but the feet were lame, and could not bear themselves without the verse, and therefore stood lamely in the verse. But didst thou... Wonder how thy name hath been hanged and carved upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came, for look here what I found on a palm tree. I was never so berhymed since Pythagoras' time when I was an Irish rat, which I, which I can hardly remember. Troyo who hath done this? Is it a man? With a chain that you once wore about your neck? Change you color? I prithee who? Oh, Lord, Lord, it's a hard matter for friends to meet, but mountains may be removed with earthquakes and so encounter. Nay, but who is it? Is it possible? Nay, I prithee, with most petitionary vehemence, tell me who it is. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, and most wonderful, wonderful, and yet again out of all whooping. Good, my complexion, dost thou think I am comparison like a man? I have doublet and hose in my disposition. One inch of delay more is a south sea of discovery. I would thou couldst stammer that thou mistake take this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of a narrow-mouthed bottle. Either all at once, 
or none at all. I pray thee, take thy cork out of thy mouth so that I may drink thy tidings. So you may put a man in your belly? What manner of man? Is he of God's making? Is his hat is his head worth a hat or his chin worth a beard? Nay, he hath but a little beard. My God will send more if the man will be thankful. Let me stay the growth of his beard, if thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin. It is young or land. Don't <gasps> up the rest of his heels and your heart both in an instant. Oh! Nay, but the devil take mocking. Speak sad, brow, and true, maid. In faith, cuz, tis he. Orlando? Or land oh! <laughs> Alas the day! What shall I do with my doublet and hose? What did he when thou sawst him? What said he? How looked he? Where went he? What makes him here? Did he ask for me? What how, what 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 did he sorry? Did he ask for me? What did he think of me? How parted he with thee? And when shalt thou see him again? Answer me in one word. You must borrow me Gargantua's mouth first. Tis a word too great for any mouth of this age's size. To say I and no in any particular catechism is more to answer. But doth he know I am in this forest in man's apparel? Looks he as freshly as the day he wrestled? It is easy to count atomies as to the soft propositions of a lover. Now relish my good findings, and relish it with good observance. I found him under a tree like a dropped acorn. He may as well be called Joe's tree when it drops forth such a fruit. Give me good audience, madam. Proceed. There he lay, stretched along like a wounded knight. No, it be pity to see such a sight. It well becomes the ground. Cry holla to thy tongue. I prithee, it curvets unseasonably. There he lay, like a hunter. Oh, ominous! He comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without a burden. Thou bringest me out of tune. Do you not know I am a woman? When I think I must speak. Sweet, say on. Soft. Here he comes. Tis he. Some fine take note. I thank you for your company, but, good faith, I am asleep in myself alone. And so would I, but yet for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. God be with you. Let's meet as little as we can. Yeah, I do hope we may be better strangers. I pray you no more with trees writing love songs on their barks. I pray you mark no more by verse by reading them all favorably. Rosalind's your love name? Yes, just. I do not like her name. There was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. What stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. You are full of pretty answers. Have you not been acquainted with goldsmiths' wives and conned them out of rings? Not so, but I answered you right painted cloth, from whence you have studied your questions. You have a nimble wit. I think twas made of Atalanta's heels. Will you sit down with me? And we too will, will rail against our mistress of the world and all our miseries. I would try no other breather in this world but myself, against whom I know most faults. The worst fault you have is to be in love. Tis a fault I will not exchange for your best virtue. I am wary of you. By my truck. I was seeking for a fool when I found you. <laughs> he had drawn it in the brook. Look but in, and you shall see him. Oh, then I shall see my own figure. Which I either take to be a fool or a cipher. I'll tarry no longer. Farewell, good signora love. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good marching you might call it. Like a saucy Mikey, and under that hat, play the game with him. Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you? I pray you, what is to clock? You should ask me what time or day. There's no clock in the forest. Then there is no true lover in the forest, else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. And why not the swift foot of time? Had that not been as proper? By no means, sir. Time travels in diverse paces with diverse persons. I'll tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. I pretty, who doth he trot with all? Mary, he trot hard with the young maid between the contract of her marriage and the day it is solemnized. If the interim be but a seven night, why, Time's pace is so hard, it seems the length of a seven year. Who ambles time with all? 
with a priest that lacks Latin, and a young man that hath not the gout, for one lives merrily because he cannot study, and the other sleeps easily, for he feels no pain. The one knowing no burden of lean and tedious penury, the other knowing no burden of, le of heavy, tedious penury. Who doth he gallop with all? With lawyers in the vacation, for though they sleep between term and term, they perceive not how time moves. Hmm. Who stays it so with all? With a thief to the gallows, for though he goes as softly as foot can follow, he finds himself too soon. Where, where dwell you, pretty youth? Oh, uh, with the shepherdess and my sister, here in the skirts of the forest, like fringe upon petticoat. Are you native of this place? As the coney you see dwell here, where she is pickled. Hmm, your action is something finer than can be purchased in such removed a dwelling. Uh, I've been told so of many. Uh, but indeed an old religious uncle of mine who taught me to speak, one who in his youth was an inland man, one who knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard many lectures against it, and thank God I am not a woman to be taxed with so many giddy offenses as he had generally taxed, as he had, de as he had generally taxed their whole sex with all. Can you recount some of the evils he laid to the charge of women? They were none principal. They were all like one another, when one, every one fell seeming monstrous until his fellow fall came to match it. I pray thee, recount some of them. No, I will not cast away my physic on those that are sick. But there is a man who haunts the forest by abusing our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks. Hangs odes upon thorns and elegies on brambles, all forsooth to find the name Rosalind. If I met that fancy monger, I would give him good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love shaken, I pray you, tell me your remedy. There are none of my uncle's marks upon. He taught me to know a man in love, in which its cage of rushes, I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? Mm, a lean cheek, which you have not. Uh, a blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. But I pardon you for that, for simply your having in beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then. Your hose should be ungar ungartered, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather putting vice in your accoutrement, else loving yourself, seeming the lover of any other. <sighs> I would I could make thee believe I love. Oh, me believe it. You may as soon make her that you love believe it which I warrant she is after to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points in which women still give the lie to their consciences. I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and, I tell thee, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary, the whippers are in love too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one, and in this manner. It was to imagine me his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time, being but a moonish youth, grieve and be effeminate, changeable, Longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything. As boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this color, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, then, then weep for him, then spit at him, that I drove my suitor from his mad humor of love to his living humor of madness, 
which was to forswear the full stream of the world and live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him, which I will take upon me to do to you. Wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there might not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day to my cot and woo me. Hmm. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. I will show it to you. And by the way, you shall tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? Yeah, with all reason I shall. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? Come on, pace good, Audrey. I will fetch up your goats, Audrey. <laughs> Am I the man yet, Audrey? Does my simple feature content you? Your features? Lord warn us. What features? As the most capricious poet, Honest Ovid was among the Goths. Oh, knowledge, ill inhabited, worse than Job in a thatched house. When a man's verses cannot be understood, nor a man's good wit is seconded by the forward thinking child understanding. It strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. Truly, Audrey, I wish the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest indeed in word? Is it a true thing? No, truly, for the truest poetry is the most feigning, and as lovers are given to poetry, what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers they do feign. Do you wish the gods had made me poetical? I do, truly, for thou swearest to me thou art honest. If thou wert a poet, I might have some hope thou didst fame. Would thou not have me honest? No, unless thou art hard favored. For honesty coupled to beauty is like to have honey a sauce to sugar. A material fool. Well, I am not fair. And therefore, I pray the gods make me honest. Truly, and to cast away honesty upon a foul wench is like to put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a wench. Though I think the gods I am foul. Well, praise be thy God for, well, praise be the gods for thy foulness. Wenchness may come hereafter, though be it as it may be, I, we, I will marry you. And to that end, I have brought Sir Oliver Martex, the vicar of the next village, who hath promised to meet me in this place of the forest and to couple us. I would fain see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy! Amen. A man may, if he were of a fearful heart, stagger in this attempt. For here we have no temple but horned beasts. No, no temple but wood. No assembly but horned beasts. But what though? Courage. Oh, here comes Sir Oliver Martex. Will you dispatch us under this tree, or shall we go with you to your court? Shall it's certainly not here to give the woman. I will not take thee on gift of any man. Truly, she must be given, or the marriage will not be lawful. Proceed, proceed, I'll give her. Good evening, um, good Montia, what you call it. How do you, sir? You are very well met. God ill you for your last company. Yeah, God ill you for your last company. I'm very glad to see you. Will you be married, Motley? Um, as the horf his, as the ox his bow, the horse his curb, the falcon her bells, and man hath his desires. And as pigeons, as, and as pigeons bill, so wedlock would be nibbling. And will you, being a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Get you to church and have a good priest tell you what marriage is. This fellow will but join you together as they join Wainscot. And one of you will prove a strong temper and a green temper work work. I am not in the mind, but I were better to be married of him than of another, for he is not like to marry me well. And if I am not very well, I will have a good excuse to leave my wife hereafter. Go thou with me, and let me counsel thee. Oh, come, sweet Audrey, we must marry, we must be married, or we must live in Baudry. Tis no matter, ne'er no fantastical knave of them all shall flout me out of my calling.
Never talk to me. I will weep. Do, I pray thee, but yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good as one would cause, therefore weep. <sighs> His very hair was of the dissembling color. Something browner than Judas's, just like Judas's own children. And this kissing as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. His kisses are nothing better than a nun's. The ice of chastity is in them. But then why did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? There is no truth in it. Do you think so? Yes, I think he is not a pig purse nor a horse dealer. But for his verity and love, I do think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm-eaten nut. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in, but he is not in. But you heard him swear downright he was. Was, not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is a stranger the word of a tapster. They are both the confirmer of fi false reckonings. He attends here in the forest on the duke, your father. Uh, I met the duke yesterday and had much question with him. He asked me of what parentage I was, and I told him of as good as he. So he laughed and let me go. But what talk we of fathers when... There is such a man as Orlando. Oh, that is a brave man. He writes brave verses, speaks brave verses, swears brave oaths, and breaks them bravely. Quite traverse, athwart the heart of his lover, as a puny tilter that spurs his horse, but on one side breaks his staff like a noble goose. But all's brave that youth mounts and folly guides. Who comes here? Mistress and Master, you have off too hard that... Young shepherds that oft complained of love, praising the, pra praising the proud disdain for shepherdess, that was his mistress. Well, and what of him? If you'll see a passion truly played between <clears throat> the, the pale complexion of love and the red glow of scorn and proud disdain, come hence a little, and I shall conduct you if you will mark it. Oh, come, let us remove. The sight of lovers do fitteth those in love. Bring us to the sight, and you shall and you shall say I'll prove a, and you shall say I'll prove a good actor in their play. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe, say that you love me not. What's in that soul of bitterness? The common executioner, whose heart the custom sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humbled neck, but first makes pardon. It will you stir her be that he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eyes. Tis pretty, sure, and very probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things, who shut their coward gates on atomies, should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all mine heart. And if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. Now counterfeit this wound, why now fall down? Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show me the wound mine eye hath made in thee. Scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean upon a rust, the cicatrice incapable of pressure. Thy palm some moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not. Nor, I am sure, there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Dear Phoebe, if ever, as I ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds visible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time, come not thou near me. And when that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks. Pity me not, as till that time I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you, who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What, though you have no beauty, I see no more in you than candle may go dark without to bed. Must you therefore be proud and pitiless? What? What means this? Why look you so upon me? I see no more in you than the ordinary of nature's sail work. Odds my little life, I think she means to tangle my eyes too. <laughs> no faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, 
nor your cheek of cafe that can entain my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her? You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. Tis such fools as you that makes the world full of ill-favored children. Tis not her glass, but you that flatters her. And in you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees and fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. So cry the man mercy, love and take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So take her to the shepherd. Fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you try to hear together. I'd rather hear you try than this man will. He's fallen in love with your foulness, and she'll fall in love with my anger. As soon as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll sauce her with bitter words. Why look you so upon me? For no ill will I bear you. I pray you, do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows me in one. Besides, I like you not. If you will know my house, tis at the tuft of olives, here hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister. Shepherdess, look on him better. For everyone, for all in the world could see, none is as in abuse a sight as he. Dead shepherd, now I find thy soul of life. Whoever loved that love, not at first sight. Huh? What sayest thou, Silvius? Pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Whatever sorrow is, the relief would be. If you do sorrow my grief and love, by giving love your sorrow and my grief, we're both exterminated. Why that word covetousness? Silvius, the time was that I hated thee. And yet, it is not that I bear thee love, but since that thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I will endure, and I'll employ thee too. But do not look for further recompense than thine own gladness that thou art employed. So holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace that I should think the most plenteous crop to, to glean the broken ears of the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll depart. No, knowest thou? Knowest thou the youth that spoke to me a while? Not very well, but I have met him off. He has bought the cottage and the bounds that the old Carly was once master of. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy, yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Yet words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. It is a pretty youth. Not very pretty. But sure, he's proud, and yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion. And faster than his tongue did make offense, his eyes did heal it up. He is not very tall, yet... For his ears he's tall, his leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. The, there was a pretty redness in his lip, a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. So it's just a difference betwixt the constant red and mingled damask. There be some woman, Silvius, had the marksman parses as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not, and yet I still have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what he had to do to chide at me? He said, mine eyes are black and my hair are black. And now, I had remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. Omittance is no quittance. I will write to him a very taunting letter. And thou shalt bear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? <gasps> Phoebe with all my heart. I'll write it straight. The matter is in my head and in my heart. I'll be bitter with him and passing short. Go with me, Sylvius.